Sometime around 15 BCE, the Roman Empire expanded into the Alps, a beautiful and strategically located mountain range in southwestern Europe. Those who lived in the Alps before Roman invasion were known to them as the Helvetii, who crafted metalwork, ceramics, and jewelry made of gold. Instead of destroying the Helvetii society, Romans integrated their two cultures peacefully, upgrading infrastructure and water supplies, building public baths, theaters, and arenas, as well as converting most of the population to Christianity. The Alps thrived, both culturally and economically, for many centuries under Roman rule. Rome crumbled to waves of Germanic tribes in the 400s CE, but the unique Alpine culture left by Roman rule was too deeply ingrained for any outsider to diminish. The region became the Germanic Kingdom of Burgundy. In the 500s, Burgundy was invaded by the Franks, another Germanic tribe, who went on to control the Alps until the year 800, when Charlemagne, King of the Franks and the First Holy Roman Empire, incorporated the Alps into his empire. But after Charlemagne's death, the Kingdom of Burgundy re-emerged, and remained independent until 1032, when Burgundy joined the Holy Roman Empire. Gothard Pass, a key European trade route, opened in 1220, providing a major boost economically in the towns of Uri and Schwitz. Since these towns were remote and basically governed themselves already, the Holy Roman Emperor granted them official autonomy, but this irritated many others within the empire. A particular opponent of Alpine autonomy was the Habsburg family who consolidated great influence in the Holy Roman Empire by the end of the 1200s. To ensure continued self-governance, the towns of Uri, Schwitz, and Unterwalden formed an alliance in the year 1291. Although its significance wasn't realized at the time, this agreement between three economically prosperous city-states called cantons would later be defined as the foundation of the Swiss Confederation. The alliance gathered their forces to defend against incoming Habsburgs, who were looking for a prompt victory. But the Battle of Morgarten in 1315 was anything but, being instead the first great victory of the unified Swiss army, and a remarkable embarrassment for the Habsburgs. The Confederation proceeded to expand, incorporating nearby towns which shared their common enemy. The Habsburgs, for their part, spent most of the 1300s trying to crush the Blossoming Confederation. But the Habsburgs lost spectacularly at the Battle of Sempach in 1386, and again at Naples in 1388. By the 1400s, the Swiss Confederation was a force to be reckoned with. However, security was the only real issue uniting these extremely diverse cantons, who governed as if they were separate states. In 1436, Zurich attempted to take advantage of a leadership vacuum in nearby Toggenburg, and claim the city as part of its jurisdiction. The other eight cantons, led by Schwitz, moved to stop Zurich's expansion. Zurich, outnumbered and in need of allies, made a deal with the Habsburgs. But Zurich and the Habsburgs failed, losing the Battle of St. Jacob under Schill. Zurich was readmitted to the Confederation in 1450, but forced to surrender control over its foreign policy as part of the deal. The burgeoning nationality of the Confederation was thus coming into shape. By the late 1400s, the Swiss had a reputation as world-class wagers of war. They displayed these skills yet again, making short work of the expansionist Charles the Bold, who once threatened all of Europe in the 1470s. The Habsburgs, who by now fought the Swiss in many wars and lost them all, returned yet again, this time forming an alliance with a group of South German city-states called the Swabian League. But Switzerland's military might was unmatched by the time the Habsburg and Swabian alliance attacked in 1499. The Swiss elites took full advantage of continued military success, and made a fortune selling mercenaries across Europe. In the early 1500s, the Swiss were called to action by the Pope, who asked that they help defend Milan, which was under attack by France as part of a larger North Italian conflict. The Swiss intervened and defeated the French at the Battle of Novara in 1513. The Swiss continued their advance further into Italy until 1515, when they were ambushed by a French and Venetian alliance in the Battle of Marignano. Switzerland's first ever military defeat. The Swiss were humbled by this loss. Except for continued sales of mercenaries, Switzerland would ignore the affairs of its neighbors moving forward. Great societal changes occurred during the 1500s, including the Protestant Reformation, culminating in bloody religious wars that swept the continent. Some cantons in the Swiss Confederation, like Zurich, home of the reformist Ulrich Zwingli, embraced the Reformed Church by the 1520s. 
Zwingli's ambitions exceeded his own city, however. He wanted to spread his religious beliefs to the rest of Switzerland. But he was met with passionate resistance from the conservative bloc of central cantons who formed a Christian union to preserve Catholicism. In 1531, the Christian union invaded Zurich and killed Zwingli in the battle. Through this swift victory, the Christian Union preserved the rights of the Kansans to dictate religious matters however they see fit. And so an uneasy, yet stable peace between Protestants and Catholics, plus continued demand for mercenaries, allowed the Swiss to remain neutral in the Thirty Years' War of 1618 to 1648, which mostly centered around the religious conflict. And despite, or perhaps because of, Swiss neutrality in the war, the 1648 Peace of Westphalia officially recognized the sovereignty of the Swiss Confederation. The now 13 cantons were no longer a mere alliance of city-states. They were a nation, independent of the Holy Roman Empire. But the Swiss people were still subject to the dictatorial tendencies of their elite class, leading to a series of popular uprisings, most notably in 1653. Such uprisings occurred with frequency throughout the late 16 and 1700s, and were always met with brutal crackdowns. The rise of Enlightenment ideas and the French Revolution upended Swiss society from an ideological standpoint, as it did to much of Europe and the rest of the world. The Swiss attempted to maintain neutrality, but Napoleon had a strategic interest in the trade routes running through the Swiss Alps and invaded in 1798 to secure the flow of commerce. His occupation ended the Confederation as it existed for 500 years prior. He replaced it with the Helvetic Republic and wrote a constitution which emphasized Enlightenment ideas granting citizens individual rights and equality under the law, but removing the sovereignty of the cantons and incorporating many nearby areas not previously part of the Confederation. This government was tumultuous and unpopular, nearly collapsing on multiple occasions throughout Napoleon's reign. Napoleon seemed to realize his mistakes by 1803, however. In order to prevent a civil war from breaking out inside the Helvetic Republic, sovereignty for the cantons was restored as it was, although the Helvetic era's individual liberties remained after the Napoleonic Wars. Differences between the Swiss people once again became apparent. Cantons used different currencies and measurement systems, spoke different languages, and did not allow for free movement between their citizens. Even after so many centuries, the cantons were still operating as distinct countries. The only political mechanism for coordination between them was the Diet, a parliament-like body. But because the six central conservative cantons were outnumbered by the others, they felt underrepresented, and formed an alliance called the Sonderbund. The Diet responded by declaring the Sonderbund group illegal and treated them like rebels, leading to a 28-day civil war in 1847. The Sonderbund group was soundly defeated at Lucerne. After the civil war, Switzerland moved quickly to restructure the fundamentals of its government. A new constitution was written in 1848, uniting the 22 cantons economically and politically more than before. It guaranteed individual rights and a democratically elected bicameral legislature. But instead of a single, all-powerful president or prime minister, the powers of the executive were designed to be shared equally between the seven members of the federal council, who are selected by the legislature. This system effectively minimized the divisions between the cantons after the Sonderbund War, allowing everyone a seat at the table. Democracy was expanded even more in 1874, when the Swiss government started allowing citizens to put any issue of public policy to vote in the nationwide referendum, sidestepping elected officials if enough grassroots interest grows around a topic. This new government allowed Switzerland to thrive. In the late 1800s, the country transformed from isolated and primarily agricultural into an industrial powerhouse and a popular tourist destination for wealthy Europeans. This economy was crushed by World War I, however. Switzerland remained neutral, as usual, but regular people lived under immense scarcity, inflated prices, and starvation wages. Soldiers on the front lines of defense were expected to serve without pay. Hyper aware of maintaining business relations during the 1920s and 30s, Switzerland was silent during the rise of fascism and its neighbors. By the time Europe was again at war in the 1940s, the Swiss seemed determined to replicate their longtime strategy of neutrality but this time was different. While Switzerland maintained trade relations with the Allies as well as the Axis, many questioned the extent to which one could accurately call them neutral. Germany was by far Switzerland's largest trade partner during the height of fighting in 1941, a vital time of the war. Women, children, elderly, and some Jewish refugees were accepted in small numbers, but many more were rejected and turned back towards German-occupied lands. 
though appeasement and neutrality in the face of Nazism is morally abhorrent, in the case of Switzerland, it is at least historically consistent. Had the government taken a harsher stance, Switzerland would have very likely been invaded. Swiss banks, which are known for strict secrecy and a diverse international clientele, were the face of a particularly significant controversy in the post-war period. Gold, purchased from the Nazis, was stolen from Jewish families during the Holocaust, and some of it ended up in Swiss banks, who refused to return those assets to their original families. The grueling legal dispute led to a settlement of 2 billion Swiss francs paid to Jewish organizations in the year 2000. Even in the 21st century, Switzerland maintains relative ambivalence with regard to its role in the world. It rejected membership of the European Union on multiple occasions, and didn't even join the United Nations until 2002 in a narrow referendum result that could just as easily have gone the other way. And although Swiss democracy was established far before the rest of the free world, women were not allowed the right to vote until 1971. Switzerland's 8.5 million people enjoy life in one of the world's most affluent and democratic societies. They speak Italian, French, German, and the often disregarded language of Romansh. Time and time again, Switzerland has proven itself as a beacon of prosperity and success, a role model that the rest of the world should follow closely. <laughs>